In this video, we will look at finite difference schemes for solving the diffusion equation and for the combination of advection and diffusion. This video follows on from results obtained in my previous videos on finite difference schemes for the advection equation. Diffusion of a dissolved substance can be modelled in one spatial dimension using the equation dc by dt equals d d2c by dx squared, where c is the concentration of the dissolved substance and d is the diffusion coefficient, which is a measure of how rapidly the substance diffuses. We're going to derive two finite difference schemes to approximate this equation, an explicit scheme and an implicit scheme. First, we note that our independent variables are x and t, and thus we have a computational domain in the xt plane. So, what behaviour would we expect to see? Well, if we look at an initial distribution of the concentration, which is triangular as shown here, then we would expect the distribution to spread over time in the way illustrated here. The area under this curve should remain constant since mass is conserved. We impose a finite difference grid onto our computational domain with fixed cell spacing delta x and time step delta t and adopt the notation cij to represent c evaluated at position i delta x and time j delta t. First, we need to choose approximations to the derivatives. Since we are stepping forward in time from an initial condition, we are going to use a forward difference approximation for the time derivative, which is accurate to order delta t. For the spatial derivative, we take a central difference approximation, which is of order delta x squared. These approximations can be derived directly from Taylor series. Now we can generate a numerical solution by substituting these approximations into the diffusion equation. We have this equation, which rearranges to the expression cij plus 1 equals cij plus r times ci plus 1j minus 2cij plus ci minus 1j, where r is a dimensionless parameter known as the Fourier number. This can be used directly as an explicit finite difference scheme. Note that although the second derivative is second order accurate, the scheme is only first order accurate because of the approximation used for dc by dt. Let's take a look at the points on the grid we are using in this equation. At point ij plus 1, we use points i minus 1j, ij and i plus 1j, giving us a triangular domain of dependence as shown here. Going back to our approximation to d2c by dx squared, we could use a central difference approximation evaluated at time step j plus 1 instead of j. Using both of these, we can set up an implicit scheme. Here, I'm going to set up a scheme of the crank nicholson type, where an equal weighting is given to the two spatial derivative approximations. We have this equation giving us this expression. Rearranging this so that values of c at time step j plus 1 are on the left hand side and values at time step j are on the right, we have this expression, which is our first order Crank-Nicholson scheme for the diffusion equation. Looking briefly at the points on the finite difference grid involved in this computation, we can see that we have a rectangular domain of dependence. The Crank-Nicholson scheme results in a tridiagonal system of equations that has to be solved at each time step. There are standard methods for solving such systems which we are not going to go into here. 
So we have two numerical schemes for the diffusion equation which deal with internal loads on a finite difference grid. But if we are to solve problems we also need to specify boundary conditions. There are three types of condition we can impose. We can specify c at the boundary as a function of time, which can of course simply be a constant. This is known as a Dirichlet condition. We can have a closed boundary. This is known as a Neumann condition. Or we can have dc by dx dependent on both the concentration and time. Let's have a look at how we would implement one of these in the numerical method. Consider the Neumann condition dc by dx at the boundaries is zero for all time. We need to number the nodes along the x-axis. Here, I'm going to number them from naught to n. At the left-hand boundary, we could use a forward difference approximation to dc by dx at x equals naught, giving us c1j minus c naught j divided by delta x. The boundary condition dc by dx equals zero thus yields c naught j equals c one j. At the right hand boundary, taking a backward difference approximation to dc by dx at x equals n delta x gives dc by dx at the boundary equal to c n j minus c n minus one j over delta x, yielding the boundary condition c n j equals c n minus one j. In the explicit case, these can be implemented directly by updating c at time step j plus 1 for all the internal nodes first, and then using these boundary conditions to find c naught j plus 1 and c n j plus 1. However, these approximations are only first order accurate. While the spatial derivative approximations were used for the internal nodes, were second order accurate. Thus, it makes sense to try to preserve the accuracy of the spatial derivative, which we can do by using central difference approximations. This involves imagining the computational domain extending a distance delta x at either end and introducing fictitious values of c at the external grid points with coordinates minus delta x and n plus one delta x. These points are sometimes referred to as ghost nodes. At the left-hand boundary, we have dc by dx equals c1j minus c minus 1j over 2 delta x. And at the right-hand boundary, we have dc by dx equals cn plus 1j minus cn minus 1j over 2 delta x. Yielding the boundary conditions, c minus 1j equals c1j, and c n plus 1j equals c n minus 1j. These can either be used directly by calculating the external values at each time step, or they can be calculated implicitly by substituting the boundary conditions into the update equations at the ends of the domain. Let's take a look at that. Consider, for example, the explicit scheme we derived earlier. At the left-hand boundary, we have c minus 1j equals c1j. Taking our update equation for i equals naught, we have this expression. Substituting for c minus 1j yields an expression for c naught j plus 1 in terms of c naught j and c1j. Similarly, at the right-hand boundary, we have cn plus 1j equals cn minus 1j, which can be combined with our update equation to eliminate the external node. Remember, this method, whether implemented directly or indirectly, is preferable to its first-order counterpart, because the truncation error is of order delta x squared. Thus, the order of the discretization error of the model is preserved throughout the domain. It is second order. Here we see some numerical results obtained using this scheme. 
with the approximations we just derived at the boundaries. I'm now going to look briefly at the transport and diffusion of a dissolved substance, which is a combination of advection and diffusion, described in one spatial dimension by the equation dc by dt plus u dc by dx equals d d2c by dx squared, where c is the concentration of the dissolved substance, u is the celerity, and d is the diffusion coefficient. In this case, we would expect our distribution to be transported with the flow at velocity u and to diffuse at the same time. As in the previous cases, we will take a first order forward difference approximation to the time derivative, and we will again use a central difference approximation for the diffusion term. For the advection term, I'm going to take an upwinded approximation to the derivative since we know that information travels from up to downstream. This will thus be different depending on whether u is positive or negative. Taking the case of a positive celerity first, we substitute our approximations into the advection diffusion equation. Rearranging this gives us this explicit scheme. And if the celerity is negative, we have this formulation, which results in this explicit scheme. For implicit schemes, we also use the approximations to the spatial derivatives shown here, which are evaluated at time step j plus 1. For the case u greater than 0, Substituting weighted averages of the spatial derivatives across the time steps into the advection diffusion equation results in the equation shown here, giving us this upwind implicit scheme. This is a tridiagonal scheme like the implicit scheme for diffusion we derived earlier, so again we would need a solver for a tridiagonal system of equations in order to implement this scheme. We need now to consider the boundary conditions we require to accompany these schemes. We've already noted the asymmetrical nature of the advection equation, hence the upwinding we utilised in formulating the schemes. As a consequence, the type of boundary condition used at each end of the domain will be different. Let's take the case u greater than zero. At the left-hand boundary, we can impose two types of condition a Dirichlet condition in which c is defined as a function of t, or a Neumann condition in which dc by dx is defined as a function of t. At the right-hand end of the computational domain, an absorbing boundary condition is imposed. This effectively means that an assumption of negligible diffusion is made, and the boundary condition is dc by dt plus u dc by dx, evaluated at x equals l, equals zero. If we consider the advection equation, it's clear that this represents material being advected out of the computational domain with propagation velocity u. This is important as it ensures that there's no reflection of material back into the domain. This boundary condition can only be applied to a wave exiting the computational domain i.e. downstream, never to one entering it. Let's look at this absorbing boundary condition for the numerical schemes we derived. The explicit upwind scheme is given by this update equation. In this case, the downstream boundary condition is Cn j plus 1 equals rho Cn minus 1j plus 1 minus rho Cn j which can be obtained simply by putting r equals 0 in the update equation at i equals n, where n plus 1 is the number of nodes in the computational domain. Notice that this numbering results from numbering the nodes from 0. Similarly, for the general weighted average implicit upwind scheme, we have this update equation, and the downstream boundary condition is given by this equation. 
which again can be obtained by setting the Fourier number to zero at i equals n. As an exercise to help you follow this working, you could derive an implicit upwind scheme for the advection diffusion equation for the case u less than zero, including the downstream boundary condition. Here we see some results obtained using the explicit upwinded scheme and the absorbing boundary condition that we just derived.